For me, a sieve is a mathematical concept, something that lets only certain types of numbers through. Today, I want to show you how to factor by use of a physical sieving device. But instead of this metal one, I'll use a paper analog. These are called factor stencils, and they were invented by Derek Norman Lamer in the 1920s, before the advent of computers to help people factor big numbers. They're a sort of paper computing machine. I'll spend most of the video explaining the intriguing mathematics behind these factor stencils, but first I'll just show you how to use them. Lamer's stencils, which were distributed to libraries around the United States, had thousands of holes on each sheet. But even with my smaller version here, I can factor any number up to about 10 million by hand, and even bigger numbers in many cases. Factoring numbers in the millions was actually the state of the art before Lamer invented his stencils. Let's roll a random number having seven digits. We'll just call this number N. I'm going to show you how to factor this number with a small amount of work entirely by hand, using the stencils. First, I need to find the integer part of the square root of n. That's a bit of a pain, but not too bad. I'll call it s0. Next, I'm going to compute several steps of a set of simple recurrence relations. It's the q values that matter to me here. If q is too big, I just try again. But anything that's three digits or less is fair game, and I keep that value for later. If I'm at an even number of steps of the recurrence, I throw in a minus sign. If I get six or seven of these decently sized Q values, then I'm ready to roll. It's possible to do a bit of extra tinkering with my numbers though. I can cast out perfect squares and I can multiply them together to get new values. Using these tricks, I can sometimes get some more small Q values. Once I've got some small Qs, I'm going to pick out the stencils from the deck with these labels. Each stencil has a single integer label. Then I overlay the stencils on top of each other and place the entire thing on top of this key of prime numbers. Just a few prime numbers are showing through the holes. These are the only possible prime factors of my number that lie below its square root. I trial divide by each one to check and see. Lo and behold, 631 divides my number n. In fact, n is 631 times 13,339. If I want to split it up further, I can apply the same method to the remaining part of my number and just keep going. If my trial divisions don't turn up any prime factors, I know my number is prime. Factor stencils were invented in 1929 by Derek Norman Lamer as a way to factor numbers before the advent of computers. Fifty sets of his factor stencils were published by the Carnegie Institution of Washington, and you can view an original set as part of the excellent online collection of the National Museum of American History, part of the Smithsonian. There's a link in the description, and I encourage you to visit this treasure trove for detailed photos and related historical items. Each stencil set consisted of 295 thin sheets of paper, each a little bigger than U.S. legal sized, plus an instruction booklet. Upon each sheet was set a grid of the first 5,000 prime numbers. Using the recurrence process I showed you, the user chose a subset of the sheets and carefully overlaid them on one another. A decade later, they were updated by John D. Elder and made on Hallworth punch cards, the punch cards you've seen in computer museums. These sets can still be found at some university libraries across the country. At the time, factorization and prime tables reached to about 10 million. In Elder's booklet, we read, Beyond this range of numbers, vast as it may seem as a solar system, lie the inconceivably remote objects of the arithmetician's universe. This much territory has been wrested from the unknown. The new stencil system could factor numbers up to several billion, sometimes further. What I think is so remarkable about Lamer's device is that somehow the deck of just 295 stencils itself contains all the information about the factorizations of billions of integers. To each integer, there's a sort of magic subset of the stencils, a hand from the deck, which will immediately reveal the factors. It turns out that the explanation for this amazing state of affairs needs a little more background than some basic arithmetic. In the remainder of the video, I'll discuss what the human race can and can't do in terms of factoring integers efficiently, and then explain exactly how the stencils work. This will take us down a winding mathematical path, touching on some very old number theory, which has a very beautiful but not that well-known geometric backstory. It's one of my very favorite mathematical visualizations. So, how does this magic work? First, let's take a moment to discuss how hard factoring really is. Factoring an integer is fundamentally different than other things we do with integers, like multiplication or long division. For multiplying and dividing, there are digit-by-digit -digit processes, which we learned in grade school. But there's nothing like that for factoring, or at least humans haven't discovered anything like it yet. 
Instead, factoring feels more like an Easter egg hunt. You do a certain amount of trial and error, and you hope to get lucky. In fact, the first and most natural way to go about looking for the factors of a number is trial division. First, check if it's divisible by 2, by dividing and seeing if the remainder is 0. Then, check if it's divisible by 3. Then, check if it's divisible by 5, and so on. You just keep going, dividing blindly by possible prime numbers until you stumble on a factor. We only have to check primes, because anything else dividing n will have prime factors we'd stumble on anyway. So, how many primes do we need to try? As a first attempt, we could try dividing by every prime smaller than n. The problem is that this is horribly inefficient. Let us take a moment to appreciate how horrible it is. Imagine an algorithm which just counts to n. For each integer from 1 to n, just say the integer out loud. So to count to 1 doesn't take too long. To count to 10 takes 10 times longer. To count to 100 is becoming a bit tiresome. It's 10 times longer again. For each extra digit in n, we have to do 10 times the work. The work we have to do is in proportion to the number itself. This is called an exponential algorithm. Now, suppose instead that you counted from 1 to the number of digits of n. For n equals 1, you would count one digit. For n equals 10, you'd count two digits, one, two. For n equals 100, you'd simply count to three. The number of digits of n is roughly the log base 10 of n. This is called a polynomial algorithm. The work we have to do is in proportion to the number of digits. That's easy peasy. If you think back to grade school multiplication and division, they work digit by digit, so they are polynomial algorithms. I remember some show off in my class doing a long division of 100 digits. It did take a big sheet of paper, but the width of that paper was just proportional to the number of digits. It would only have been twice as hard to do one of 200 digits. As a summary, polynomial algorithms are algorithms where you do log n work, or take log n time, if you like, on an input number n. I don't care what base you use in the log, and we also include, to be a bit more, bit more flexible, a polynomial in the logarithm, including fractional powers like the square root. An exponential algorithm is something where the work you have to do is polynomial in n itself. So things like n cubed, or the square root of n. Things are so dire in this situation that I don't even mind if you throw in some log n factors. That's not really changing the magnitude of your sadness when you are faced with an exponential algorithm. Now, you might be wondering about the names here. Why don't I call the first kind of algorithm logarithmic? The answer is that what I'm interested in is the runtime of the algorithm in terms of the input. Take a look at these two numbers. Think of them as written on a tape that's being fed into the computer. The first one will take about three times longer to read into the machine, which is to say it has about three times the number of digits. I'm interested in the runtime in terms of the read time, that is to say, the number of digits. So a polynomial algorithm is just that, polynomial in the number of digits. In computational number theory, such as the search for factoring algorithms, polynomial algorithms are like beautiful orchids, and exponential algorithms are like weeds. Easy to come by, but not worth anything on the black market. So back to our question, how many primes should we check? If your number can be written as a product, n equals a times b, then at least one of the two numbers a or b has to be less than or equal to the square root of n. After all, if both were bigger than that, then multiplying them would get something bigger than n. So, in trial division, you might have to trial divide by every prime number that is less than the square root of n before you stumble on a factor. If n is a big number, this is a lot of trial division. There are about x over log x primes below any stopping point x. So that means two square root n over log n trial divisions. For a number with seven digits, like the number that we've been trying to factor here, that's checking three or four hundred different primes. But more importantly, checking them all is an exponential algorithm, so we aren't going to be able to factor very big numbers. Despite the combined effort of the human race for millennia, we don't yet have a polynomial algorithm. We can do a lot better than just trial dividing all the primes up to the square root of n, but most of these improvements don't actually get us out of the realm of our exponential algorithms. We have a few algorithms that are a wee bit better than exponential, these are called sub-exponential, but nothing anywhere near polynomial. This fact, our collective failure to invent a polynomial time factoring algorithm, is the basis of the security of RSA, one of the principal cryptographic protocols used for securing data in the modern world. In fact, if someone comes up with a reasonable polynomial time factoring algorithm today, most of that cryptography will quite suddenly not be protective at all. It's deliciously ironic that this major intellectual failure, the very fact of it, has itself proven to be the substance of a major technology. The business of trying to come up with efficient algorithms for factoring is a matter of great international concern, 
In researching this video, it was a treat to stumble across an account written by Lamer a few years after his stencils. He was describing his invention of a mechanical factoring machine based on the same concept as the stencils. An engine turned belts with holes, and what he called an electric eye caught the alignment of the holes. Lamer devised a number of ingenious mechanical number theory devices over the years. In this essay, he wrote defiantly of its purpose. It will come as a shock also to some to be told that there is, so far as can be seen now, absolutely no practical application expected to develop out of this astonishing machine upon which so much thought and care has been expended. There is a cowardly and slinking sort of scientist, no doubt, who is ashamed or afraid to take a walk in the country with the avowed purpose of enjoying the landscape. He must provide himself with a fishing rod or a collecting basket of some sort, so that if one asks him why he is abroad, he will be able to point to some practical application for his stroll in the hills. He is, no doubt, merely trying to avoid the odium that seems to have attached itself to the poet or to the musician, who is hard put to it to produce a healthy bread-and-butter reason for making a sonnet or a symphony. To listen to the apologists for the study of pure mathematics, one would get the impression that the study is sustained not by the wonder and beauty of the subject, but by its external utilities. But how little of the vast field of mathematics has to do with the study of the outside world? The theory of differential equations stretches far beyond its application to bridges and universes. Modern mathematics is of more importance in its philosophical than in its physical implications. Who can tell? Perhaps in some far distant century they may say, strange that those ingenious investigators into the secrets of the number system had so little conception of the fundamental discoveries that would later develop from them. Okay, back to our stencils. Remember, the positions on each stencil correspond to possible prime factors, the first 450 primes in my set. Each time I lay down a new stencil, I'm ruling out some prime factors, blocking some holes. So each Q value I come up with is somehow telling me to rule out about half the primes. By overlaying them, I rule out more and more until just a few possibilities remain. But what are the Q labels? These are called quadratic residues. Fix an integer n. If we take the infinite list of perfect squares and take all their remainders when we divide by n, it may be surprising to notice that we'll only get certain remainders. These are the quadratic residues, the residues or remainders of squares. Every possible remainder is either a quadratic residue, or it's not. In the standard practice, if the residues share a factor with n, for example the residue 0, it's considered a separate case, but for the purposes of what we're doing here, we can consider these quadratic residues also, because for example 0 squared has remainder 0. So it's convenient to think about the remainders of integers upon division by n as living on a clock. This clock gives us arithmetic modulo n. The numbers on the clock are sometimes called residues. In modular arithmetic, we can still add and multiply as if the clock numbers are regular numbers, but we always write just the remainder of the number and not the number itself. We're used to this kind of modular arithmetic, in fact, when we work with a clock, which shows us time modulo 12. 11 plus 2 should be 13, but we usually just call it 1 o'clock. I have a whole video series on modular arithmetic, but for us, we'll need only a few facts. The really important fact for us is the following fundamental principle. If x is a quadratic residue modulo n, then it's a quadratic residue for every prime divisor of n. Let's explain why. Suppose that x is a residue modulo b, that is, a number on the modulo b clock. Then, if x is a quadratic residue modulo a times b, then x is also a quadratic residue modulo b. That's because if I can find a perfect square that has remainder x when I divide by this multiple ab, then it'll have remainder x when I divide by just b itself. That is, if I can write y squared as a multiple of ab plus x, then it's also a multiple of b plus x. This relationship between bigger and smaller clocks is actually just wrapping the big clock around the little one a times. So here it is, the fundamental principle. If x is a quadratic residue modulo n, then it's a quadratic residue for every prime divisor of n. Now, the name of the game with the factor stencils is to find quadratic residues modulo n, the number I want to factor. If x is a quadratic residue modulo n, then I include the x stencil in my hand. The x stencil is designed to have a hole punched above every prime p for which x is a quadratic residue mod p. Since x is a quadratic residue mod n, by the fundamental principle, any prime p dividing n will also have x as a quadratic residue. 
That is, it'll have a hole in the x stencil. So the only candidate primes for n are those with holes in the x stencil. Each stencil deals with the primes up to at least square root of n. It has just about half of its holes punched. This isn't obvious, but if I hand you a residue and a prime, there's about a 50-50 chance the residue is quadratic modulo that prime, and that holds if I fix the prime and vary the residue, or if I fix the residue and vary the prime. So the x stencil cuts out very close to half of the available possible prime factors. Another non-obvious but true fact is that the stencils are essentially independent in their choice of holes. So with two stencils, I'm down to a quarter of the possibilities, and with three, I'm down to an eighth, and with four, I'm down to a sixteenth, etc. It doesn't take too much to get down to a manageable set of possible factors. Let's be slightly more precise about that. For each stencil we add to our hand, we cut down the possible prime factors by half. So the size of a hand should be around log base 2 of the number of primes. In this illustration, having 8 primes means we need about 3 stencils. To factor n, our stencils should show square root of n primes, since unless n is prime, at least one of the prime factors will be smaller than square root n. So we'll need log base 2 of square root of n factor stencils, which is just half of the log base 2 of n. This is surprising. The number of stencils that I need is actually just polynomial. There are exponentially many possible factors, square root of n, but with k stencils, I cut that down to the square root of n over 2 to the k. So choosing k to be around the log of the square root of n, we get down to just one or a few primes. That means the work I do by hand is polynomial too. Each iteration of the recurrence relations gives a new stencil, so I need to compute a new term about log square root of n times but we know there are no polynomial factorization methods. So how can this be? Before I answer that question, let's talk about where these recurrence relations come from. The goal is to find quadratic residues modulo n, but that's kind of a tricky question. Without knowing the factorization of n, it can be hard to tell if, say, 2 is a quadratic residue modulo n, or at least without just squaring everything in sight in the hopes of turning up a 2. That would be an exponential algorithm. It's easy to find random quadratic residues, though. I can just square random things and see what turns up. The problem with that is that I don't want to have to produce a gigantic deck of stencils. Ideally, I'd like a way to find small quadratic residues modulo n. That way I can have a small deck just of small residues. Lamer proposed a few methods, but the fastest method he proposed, that I'm using at the beginning of this video, is based on a very old theory that I'll illustrate with this geoboard. Think of this geoboard as a Cartesian plane. This here is the origin. The integer points, those with integer coordinates x and y, are marked with the pegs. Now suppose I want to factor the number n. I want to draw a line through the origin of slope square root n. I'm going to represent that with a rubber band. That's an irrational slope, so it'll never actually hit a peg after the origin, at least if my pegs are infinitely thin. Now here's the trick. If I pull the rubber band apart down here at the origin, it'll catch on the pegs of the geoboard. The pegs it catches on, I notice a few up here as well, the pegs it catches on are the integer points that are in some sense closest to my line of irrational slope. They're kind of like successive best approximations to my slope, or maybe like waypoints directing you through the maze of pegs along your line. I want to formalize this idea and capture the idea of closeness to the line. Once we do that, we'll see that these close pegs naturally give small quadratic residues. To capture what the rubber band is doing, I'd like to come up with some sort of measure of closeness to the line. I'm going to think of a line of a rational slope like a river valley and draw a sort of topographical map so points at lower altitude are closer to the line. The level sets or topographical lines that are most natural to use here, if you think back to how we're pulling apart the rubber band at the origin, are hyperbolas. So we'll add the hyperbolas y squared minus nx squared equals k for various different k. These all have the line of slope square root n as an asymptote. I can think of y squared minus nx squared as a sort of measure of height. The asymptote lies in the valley, and being low down means being near the asymptote. So these rational points that my rubber band caught on will tend to be in the valleys, lying on hyperbolas of small k value. Now, here's the amazing bit. These integer points x, y have k small. In other words, y squared 
modulo n, is a small quadratic residue. So the method Lamer proposes is just to find these integer points, and by extension, their associated small residues. So our goal is to find x, y, so that the slope, y over x, is close to the slope square root n. In other words, we just want to find rational numbers which are very close to the square root of n. You might try just truncating the decimal expansion of the square root, but this will restrict you to denominators that are powers of 10. That's the x value here in x, y. And those might not be really good points, the ones picked out by the rubber band. These really good points, the rubber band points, actually get very sparse as you go further out, and they're kind of hard to find. So instead of the rather arbitrary decimal system, famously dictated by our biological makeup, there's actually a very natural and beautiful way to organize the rational numbers on the real line. It's sometimes called the fairy subdivision. It may be less convenient for teaching long division in grade school, but it's much more natural from the perspective of the numbers themselves, and it'll tend to turn up these rubber band points in a very natural way. Imagine lowering yourself down into the peg board and looking out at the pegs from the origin. Think of each peg, x, y, as associated to a rational number, its slope, y over x. So in this world, some pegs will be hidden by others. In this view from above, the light gray dots are hidden from view, and the dark gray dots are the pegs that you can see from the origin, with their associated slopes shown by the line segments, which are actually the direction that you look to see them. This is a picture of the rational numbers. One way to see the slopes as rational numbers is to just imagine a circle around the origin and draw a dot where each of the slopes, these rays, actually pokes through that circle. Like it would look to you if you stood at the origin, each dot should be bigger if it's closer and smaller if it's farther away. It's kind of like taking a photograph of what you see from your position. Now grab those dots and stretch them out straight. This is your view from the origin. You get something like this. These are the rational numbers. Here's zero. Here's one, and in between them, if you add those two vectors on the geo board, is one half. This adding of vectors, if you think of what it does to the rational numbers, is actually given a special name. It's called the mediant operation on two fractions. It just means adding the numerators and denominators independently. It's not, of course, the same thing as adding them just as numbers. Now, beginning with zero and one, the mediant is a half. Between a half and one, there's two thirds. Here on the number line, as I add the median of fractions, I place an arc over each new sort of line segment that I'm creating. This creates a sort of history of the fairy subdivision showing how it was created. Let's do a few more iterations here. I won't prove it here, but it's a wonderful fact that this process never misses any rational numbers. They all appear exactly once. The simple ones tend to appear early in the process, and as you go on, the more complex ones with bigger numerators and denominators start to appear. Now, placing the square root of n on the number line, it, look, it lies somewhere in this infinite subdivision. In fact, I can think of it as having an address, or even Google map directions. To get there, I enter the first big bubble from the top, I stay left, and then stay left again, and then I turn right, and then turn left, and so on. Now the fairy subdivision works its magic. As you navigate, each time you make a turn from staying right for a while to staying left for a while, or vice versa, you're turning past a rational number on that corner, the bottom point in the bubble. And these are the pegs the rubber band picks out on the geo board. What I'm actually telling you here is the story of continued fractions. These integer pegs chosen by the rubber band are known as continued fraction convergence. But continued fractions usually look like this a mess of typographical insanity and recurrence relations that really doesn't betray their beautiful geometric origin. I'm also telling you the story of the Euclidean algorithm, because continued fractions are a generalization of the Euclidean algorithm, the most fundamental algorithm in algorithmic number theory dating back thousands of years. But that's a story for another time. What's important for us here is that the continued fraction expansion, like the Euclidean algorithm, is very efficient. It's been streamlined in most modern treatments, but essentially what one does is build the fairy subdivision near the square root of n, or whatever you have as a target point. You subdivide, then you ask which subsegment contains the square root of n, and then you subdivide that one, and so on. You can be a bit slicker here by adding a number of copies of one endpoint at a time, and that number that you need is easily obtained. So what you essentially do is one step per corner, or one step per rubber band point, and all this can be done by hand. Those are actually the recurrence relations that Lamer provides in his user manual. Just much distilled.
In this way, one obtains small quadratic residues modulo n. It turns out the residues spit out by these recurrence relations can be expected to be smaller than the square root of n. If we'd like them even smaller, Lamer provides some more tricks in his user manual, like combining residues and knocking out perfect square factors, which I did a bit of in my computation by hand. But the bottom line is, the work I do by hand is polynomial. So, is this a polynomial time factoring algorithm? Well, the catch here is that the stencils themselves have square root of n primes on each stencil, half of them punched out as holes. So the stencils themselves are exponential in size. And what's more, the quadratic residues we obtain are guaranteed to be about square root n in size, so our deck must have exponentially many stencils in it. So, we haven't broken all of modern cryptography. But somehow, creating the stencils in the first place is a really amazing pre-computation. If somehow we could accomplish that, then we would only need polynomial time to factor any one number we may be interested in. Although, unfortunately, we'd also need exponentially sized hands to hold the stencils.